Okay. okay, I'll start again. My name is Mareike, and together with Avery, um, we would like to welcome, or I would like to welcome you to our class here on the Maya. Um, we used uh, the, the popular topic of uh, 2012, what's going to happen uh, uh, supposedly in December. Um, <laughs> so as, an, as a, a hook to uh, interest you um, in, uh, uh, to, uh, in the Maya culture. Um, and apparently it has worked because you have all come. <laughs> um, I am going to give you a little outline of our class um, as, as it sort of develops. I think we're meeting six times, including today. Today's class, in today's class, we'll give you an overview on what we commonly understand uh, as Maya culture. What do we mean when we talk about the Maya um, and so on. Um, our next class, next week, um, is, has a um, historical angle. Uh, we'll take, um, we give you an introduction into the hieroglyphic writing of the Maya, um, um, how Maya used the calendar. You'll, we'll teach you how to do Maya math, how, how to calculate in Maya, the Maya in the Maya ways. Um, we unfortunately we don't have enough time to actually make you able to read the glyphs, but <laughs> our goal will be to make you a little more familiar with the way the glyphs are written, um, so you can recognize patterns, you'll be able to recognize numbers, um, and then we'll use that to talk a little bit about what was actually said by the classic Maya uh, about this date uh, in, in December of this year. Um, and then lastly, I will tell you a little bit about how the calendar and sort of Maya ways of calculating time are still used today. Um, the following class focuses on language. Um, I teach Kiche Maya here at Vanderbilt. Kiche Maya is a language spoken by about uh, one million speakers in Guatemala through migration. Um, into the United States. We have little Kiche clusters now into in, in the United States as well. Um, it's one of the largest indigenous languages spoken in the Americas. After Aymara and Quechua in South America, uh, Kiche is the third or fourth largest, depending on how you count. Um, when I tell people, or when they ask me, what do you do? And I say, I teach a Maya language the most common reaction I get is, I thought they were all dead. <laughs> and um, <laughs> they are not. <laughs> this is one goal that we have for this class for you all to, to realize, although many people are familiar with the fantastic and very impressive archeologi archeological heritage of the Maya, they are very much still alive. They live contemporary lives with real problems, as we'll see in, um, in further on in this class. In the language class, I will invite my assistant um, in teaching Kiche. She's a native um, Kiche speaker to come here, and we'll give you a little workshop. So you get to learn a few phrases in Kiche, how to say your name, where you're from, and give you an, a sort of an uh, introduction into a very different language than the one you used to speak every day. The following class focuses on literature. Literature is a big word, um, and um, I tell you right away, uh, Maya literature is not quite what you probably have in mind when you th think or picture the word literature. However, the most important indigenous language document from the colonial times was written in Kiche Maya. Uh, it's called the Popol Vuh. It's, although I personally don't really like uh, the term, it's commonly referred to as the Kiche Bible. It tells us uh, stories of creation, stories of good and evil, and all that kind of um, themes. Um, we we'll read a passage from this book. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the historical background, and then we we'll get to watch a few clips of a, of a, a movie, an animated movie, 
that was made in the mid 80s and has um, very nice visuals. Kiche uh, is spelled K, glottal stop or apostrophe. Yes. <laughs> it's, I'll, I'll have his few slides later on. And, um, um, then the following class um, focuses on modern Maya. Like I said, the Maya are not dead. Um, we have in, um, in Guatemala, we focus here in this class mainly on Guatemala because it's both of our specialties. Maya, however, also live in, in Mexico. Um, but uh, our focus will be mainly on, on Guatemala here. Um, we'll have a grad student who is from Guatemala who has worked for the UN in Guatemala um, present you some statistics and graphs about the reality of being an indigenous person, a Maya person in Guatemala. As you will see, it goes along with high degree of po poverty, um, illiteracy, and not being able to find work, and so on. It's a very um, interesting um, class to see how other people in the world live. And I hope it'll give you, a, um, so it completes the picture of what it means to be Maya. Uh, to have on the one hand this interesting heritage and then on the other hand you know, how, how do we make a living um, in, in this world. Our last class wraps up um, all and tries to, to combine all what we've touched on um, and Avery will present a um, project um, where Vanderbilt is involved, or how Vanderbilt is involved in Guatemala. Um, we have a very strong center of Latin American studies with a focus on, um, on Guatemala, as well as our anthropology department has one of their strengths is in Maya studies. So out of this have arisen f a few projects where students are involved, People from the community here in Nashville are involved all through, through Vanderbilt. So our goal for this class is um, to give a view on the Maya from, a very, from various angles and give you um, a glimpse of how complex the, the idea of Maya is. Now I've told you a little bit uh, what you can expect from us, or what you will expect from us, hopefully. Um, now, um, I, we also would like to expect some, something from you, which is um, participation. So we welcome questions and comments. We hope um, to, to be able to answer questions. We also hope that we um, leave you with a few questions that you can ponder at home and maybe change your perspective on how you see the world or how you see the Maya. And with that, I'll have, I have to unclip something. Um, can you Um, hi, very good to see all of you all. As Marika said, we are very excited about this class. Um, excited to see all of you all. And I'll just add a quick note on um, the syllabus. I believe that uh, you all just, the syllabus just got distributed to everyone. And there should be um, an additional reading that will be a handout that Norma will give you. And I think she's also sent you an email. We do have suggested readings for each class. Some of them are very long. We think they're great articles, so if you have the time and you're interested in doing it, please do read the articles before the class, but it's, you, know, you will be able to participate fully in the class without reading the articles. Um, but, but they're there in a PDF format for you, so you can open it and either print it out or read it online, depending on what you prefer. Uh, so what we wanted to ask you all to, to start the participation part of this class is to go ahead and ask you all, why did you sign up for this class? What interests you about the Maya? Or what interests you about 2012? What do you all know coming into this class about 2012? Nothing. <laughs> okay. Nothing? Anyone else? Okay, the world's going to end in December, yes. Anything else? 
Oh, good. Great. Where are you going? Great, great. That's covering a lot of ground. That's great. I was in Guatemala as part of a group about a year ago, and I was interested in the food web that's created by the people and mm -hmm. the culture. And where, which areas of the country did you visit? Oh, oh gosh. And people? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We went, that was the one trip that I took a couple weeks ago. Okay. Great, great. We hope we'll be able to convey that to you. Yes? Images, photograph again of this in the National Geographic, the giant heads, trees, carved, crowned, etc. What about in the jungle? Great. 50 years ago. Yes. I'm here because my granddaughters are studying Latin America and Mayan history, and I don't want to hear quite as ignorant as that. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful. Anyone else? Uh huh. Okay. Yes. In many of these sites that you all are mentioning, I don't know if anybody's been to Tikal in Guatemala, but it sounds like it. And Chichen Itza, they are having events surrounding this December twenty-first date. So, but but you of course are going in in April. The person that's going in April might be a good idea because that way you're ahead of time. <laughs> okay. There was another hand over here. Ignorance, good. <laughs> Learning opportunity, great. That's what we definitely want this to be. Yes, ma'am. And my mother lives there, so she needs this all I asked for. Oh, wonderful. In, in Guatemala? In Guatemala. Great. Other? Mm -hmm. Well, and that's interesting because we just finished up a freshman seminar on this same topic. And so we were teaching uh, freshmen at Vanderbilt, you know, going over the same uh, basic ideas that we'll go in this class. And one of the students had studied it in, in her fifth grade class and so had forgotten it and wanted to come back and, and relearn. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. That's something that we will begin to touch on today and then get more into in the next, I think, two second and third classes. So, great question. Thank you. Any other? Uh -huh. I want to find out more about mind, soul, and soul. Okay, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Anybody? I saw a hand over here. Okay. Yes, well that is a wonderful question and, and as Marika mentioned in the last class, I'll talk about some of the projects that we have in there and one of the things that we've been trying to develop is a collaboration with the Vanderbilt Nursing School to have this exchange of knowledge with um, midwifery students here at Vanderbilt in the United States and learning but, but a real you know, bi-directional exchange of knowledge with Mayan midwives in Guatemala. So there, there is a real, real truth to that. Mm -hmm. uh, I've recently heard that one of the major uh, tour companies has canceled all of its uh, tourist activities in uh, Guatemala because of the security issues. Can you address that? I will, address, I will address that today. We'll talk about that today and then again later in the class. So once again, today we'll kind of touch a little bit on everything and then we'll go deeper throughout the class. But that is, that is one of the main issues right now facing Guatemala and Mexico. So it's, it's a, definitely something we will be talking about. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh -huh. I was wondering how they selected their rulers and uh, uh, what they had classes and uh, did you move from lowly class to higher? Or okay, good question. And I can address that in a, in a moment when I, I will talk, be talking about the ancient Maya somewhat today. Okay, should we begin talking? Yeah. Yes. Okay.
All right, let's begin our overview section. Uh, what are the Maya? Where do, the where, where do they live? What do we mean when we say Maya? What you have in front of you here is a map of uh, Mesoamerica, um, and it's a language map. Um, or at, at least I should say it includes Mesoamerica. Mesoamerica is a term that describes a cultural area um, that extends from uh, central Mexico, just about um, here, here we go, uh, from this part where you see the red until down to Costa Rica. Um, all cultures in this area share certain traits. For example, the use of, a, of the same basic calendar system. Uh, their languages, although they are not related genetically, um, uh, what that means I'll explain uh, in a few minutes, um, share certain traits because they have been in intense co uh, contact with, with, with each other. For linguists, that is a very, very interesting point. Uh, and what linguists look at specifically are grammatical connections or similarities rather than loan words. Loan words get adopted very, very easily from one language in the other. And as a German sp native speaker, I can vouch for that because German is inund inundated by English <laughs> loan words. Um, uh, that happens really quickly and does not give us a good indication of, uh, what ki of a, a relationship. Um, what you see uh, in light blue um, here, can you see the Maya? Yes, you can. Um, is the Maya area. And like I said, it's a language map. Um, compared to the rest of this area, you'll see the Maya languages form a compact block. Um, now, the very clever of you may have noticed, <laughs> and I hope that's all of, of you here, there's another blue spot up here in Mexico. <laughs> Um, and indeed, those are the Huastec people. Um, they at one time belonged to the Maya family and have wandered off. We don't know why, um, but they did. Their language shows uh, a genetic relationship with the remaining, or with the other Maya languages. Right now, or today, they do not have any cultural or emotional or identity connection with the Maya people. Uh, but we know that at some point uh, they, they belonged together. Uh, there it is. What you also may see, that in the Maya area here, um, you have pockets of red. There's one here, down here. Oops. This I have. Um, you see the same red over here in central Mexico. The red indicates the Nahua people, the Nahua languages. Those, this is the language that was spoken by the Aztecs. Often Maya and Aztec get confused. Uh, Aztec culture centered in, was centered in central Mexico in this area. Maya culture is here southern part of Mexico, the peninsula of Yucatan, all of Guatemala, Belize, Honduras, El Salvador, oh, Honduras, El Salvador, and then it sort of stops. The reason we have red pockets on Nahua speakers in the area is because um, up until the Spanish uh, contact invasion, we have um, Nahuatl speakers, merchants and traders settling in, in, in the Maya-speaking area. Another indication of intense cultural contact between Maya and other peoples. If you have traveled to Guatemala, um, I don't know if you noticed, but many place names, city names, indeed the term Guatemala itself is a Nahuatl term. Um, Many Maya city, um, cities in Guatemala have um, three names. They have a, a Nahuatl name that is the one that you find on the map in the official name. They have a Maya name, and often they have an, sort of a nickname. 
if we take uh, the second largest city in Guatemala, for example, Quetzaltenango, um, that is the Nahuatl term. The, um, the Maya term is Xelahu, and the endearing, the nickname for the same city is Xela. So if people, if you want to be in, you say, I'm going to Xela. That means you really know what you're talking about instead of, I'm going to Quetzaltenango. Um, so that gives you an overview how, where, how the Maya people are located um, in the greater context. This map here shows you the distribution of Maya languages today. Um, I want to say one word. Um, here we talk about Maya languages and not about dialects or tongues or something else. Uh, the Maya language family is a language family just like the Indo-European um, language family. Um, and within that family, you have different languages. Um, so the different Maya languages that we'll be talking about refer to each other in the same way as English refers to or is related to German, for example. Ling linguists distinguish, uh, or have a definition uh, what dialects are and what, uh, what languages are. Dialects are regional varieties within a language. So in the US, for example, we could say Southern English is a dialect of American English, or Northern, Northeastern English is a dialect of American English. Um, but we all speak English. Um, languages cannot understand each other. There's no mutual intelligibility between languages. And when once that happens, we'll talk about different languages. Now, this seems very easy. In practice, it's often difficult, and the decision when to call something a dialect versus a language is often a political one, because um, it goes together with history, with self-identification. Uh, we have an example for that is uh, the split up in Jugos Yugoslavia, for example. All uh, Serbo and, uh, Serbian and Croatian are really not that dif uh, different from each other. But for political reason, um, they're classified now or see themselves as, as different languages. A similar thing happens in the Maya area. There is one language, the Achi people, want to be classified as a different group, although their language really, lingu from a linguist standpoint, is a dialect of Kiche. But we are classified as a language for historical reasons. Um, so you notice a few things here on the map. Um, uh, first of all, you have different colors. Those colors refer to different subgroups within the Maya language family. Uh, you have different type fonts, uh, size. Uh, the bigger the size, font, um, font size, the larger the group of speakers is. Um, so we have... Um, Big font here, Kiche, and here you can see it's spelled. It's K, uh, an apostrophe, I C H E apostrophe. Kiche is one of the larger languages uh, in the Maya area, as is um, Yucatec up here. Um, you see there are different colors, different language families. Um, you may also notice that we have a really high concentration in the western highlands of Guatemala. Um, if you see how many languages are distributed here in the south versus Yucatec in the north. Um, Guatemala has 22 different Maya languages. Uh, within those languages, we have dialects. So if you go to Quiche, it has about five different dialects which basically means each region or each larger city speaks its own variety of Quiche and that they may use different terms, words for the same thing or slightly different grammatical constructions. They can understand each other. Um, um, but, yeah. Um, then, one interesting part is here. Um, you see this area. In the northern part of Guatemala, it's rainforest area. This is the area where the classic Maya civilization 
was located mainly um, in other areas as well. But you may wonder if this is where the main Maya area was a thousand years ago, uh, why do we ha don't we have any languages there now? And the one we have is in tiny font that means there are very few speakers. That has historical reasons. At one point, this, this middle central area was a highly or densely populated area. And uh, the ruins on the, the cities that we have are, are, are witness to that. With the um, arrival of the Spaniards in this area, um, suffered a tremendous loss of population through disease and resettlement. Um, the Itza, I hope you can see that that's the tiny name here in the center, were actually the last Maya people uh, conquered, so to speak. That was in 1697. That, that was, I'm a musician in my other life, so that was when Johann Sebastian Bach, the famous, <laughs> was two years old. <laughs> um, so um, people were resettled, taken out of this area, resettled in highlands of Guatemala, and this area was for a long time sort of not very populated. Um, and that's why we have uh, uh, sort of a little skewed language distribution there. So if we go back a little into history, and there were some questions about migration earlier, um, linguists based on, um, on modern languages and based on the idea that languages change at a certain or constant rate, historical linguists try to sort of reconstruct the history of languages. And they have done so with the, with the Maya languages as well. And they have come up with the following scenario. About uh, 4,000 years ago, 2,000 bef before Christ, and where's my mouse here, um, they propose we have, there was one thing, it's a hypothetical and reconstructed uh, idea um, of Proto-Mayan. This language was probably never really spoken as such, but we use it as a, uh, as a tool, so to speak, to, to, to track and uh, see how languages develop. Um, I wish I could have this mouse here not disappear all the time. Um, there it is. Um, so from here, we see 2,200 uh, BC, a migration out into the Huastec area. Those are the people the, the, that were now uh, in the northern part of Mexico located. Then we have several other um, uh, migrations out. For example, the Yucatec speakers, or let's say a group separated out 1,400 before BC, uh, settled in Yucatan um, and developed their own language there based on what they came with and this is what we call now Yucatec. So we have several of these movements within the Maya area. The colors again relate to the different language families. What is very interesting is, for example, this last migration um, here we go, in, in pink, uh, the Kichean people happened around 1200. So this is about 300 years before the, the Spaniards came. And we can collaborate the, this date with historical data that we can gather from colonial time indigenous documents that we have, like the Popol Vuh. Um, so we can establish how more or less how people moved. However, there is a caveat. It looks very neat and clean on a map like this, and we put numbers on it and timelines. Of course, it's not the case that one group of people decides, today we are going to move out. <laughs> um, uh, but it gives us a, 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 an idea how things probably were. This is a... Um, slide showing you the complexity of the Maya language family. Um, and I just wanted to show you uh, the variety all the way to the right of Maya languages that we have. And remember, those are languages. Um, 
you see some of them have a cross or an X attached to those. Those are the ones that we know are extinct now. Uh, for, for, for Cholti, for example, um, the blue one with a cross, that is the language I wrote my master's thesis on. We have one document from the 17th, early 17th century on that language. Uh, it's not spoken anymore. Um, those were people that lived in the central area uh, on the earlier map that looked so empty. They were taken out, mixed with other people, and put in other towns, and eventually their language uh, died, died out. Um, now, I want to end um, to give you a little impression how Maya life looks like with a short video. You see here Nikte, uh, a linguist. Um, we'll get a little more into detail this later, but um, in, after, in the beginning of the 90s, with the, when the civil war in Guatemala came to an end, um, there was, for, for the first time, a political space for Maya to publicly affirm and assert their identity as Maya speakers. Um, a, a few, or quite a few actually, linguists, Maya linguists were trained, who then went out to record language data on their own languages. And Nikte, who you see here, was one of the first ones. Uh, this video is about six minutes long. She is talking in her native language, which is Achi. So it gives you an, uh, an idea how Maya languages um, sound like. She is talking about uh, language revitalization efforts in, in Guatemala. And it gives you a, a nice visual to how a typical life, uh, Maya life or scenes look like. You see women dressed in woven clothes. You see a few ceremonies, um, um, daily life. You also see that she often refers to elders. Um, elders are, hold a very high respect in Maya culture um, as because they have you know, lived so much in their own life that they can give advice to the younger generation. Um, and I hope this works. No, it didn't. It worked earlier, but um, <laughs> we'll see. <coughs> Maybe down here. I'll fix the technical problems and um, show you show it to you later. I'm going to hand off to um, Avery now. Alrighty, so I am going to take you on a whirlwind journey <laughs> going from the ancient Maya period to the present day. So once again, as we've said, we'll, we'll, this is the introductory day, so we're just kind of trying to give you the background. So this is going to be fast, um, but we will 
go deeper into some of these issues and we hope to have a little time at the end of the class for you all to ask questions about anything that particularly caught your interest. Um, and also feel free to stop me when I'm talking about something. So uh, many people, when, when Marika first started talking and she said that most people think that, that the Maya are dead because they're thinking of the ancient Maya who uh, are the people that built the fabulous city-states in, in Mesoamerica. These are what we refer to now as the ancient Maya. And their civilization really flourished between 250 AD or current era, era CE and um, 900. And so uh, this was what we consider the classic period of Maya civilization. And this is when these uh, uh, large city-states, and I'm also looking for this, large city-states such as Tikal and Palenque were built throughout Mesoamerica. Here's another map of Mesoamerica. You just saw one that Marika put up uh, that shows you, this is uh, central Mexico, Yucatan Peninsula. This is modern day Guatemala. Here's Belize. Honduras today, or yeah, Honduras today, and El Salvador. And so uh, these are some of the city-states that were built. And so I want to tell you a little bit about what these states were like. There was a question about whether or not it was a stratified society. It was. They were ruled by uh, dynasties of kings. If you were an elite member, you were born into it. This was not a society in which you could move up and down very easily. Uh, there were slaves who were usually captured from other groups. There were uh, from other city states. There were laborers, the people who built these these monuments and ruins and temples. There were um, the elite, and then there were the kings, the people who did the writing, who wrote the glyphs that we now study were also elite. You had to be very educated and specially trained, and you were in many ways considered an artist if you were a scribe. So uh, it was definitely a stratified society. Archaeologists have realized that one of the reasons, one of the ways in which we stratified societies develop is because people are able to have permanent settlements. And this is a great example of that. Um, large permanent settlements were made possible by the ability to produce enough food to feed all of these people. And so at this point in time, these were very large cities. Up to 70,000 people lived in some of these cities. And so that meant that they had to have a strong system of intensive agriculture, so the large scale production of food, to be able to feed all of these people, uh, which is considered quite an advancement um, at this point in time. They also, as I just said, had a system of writing glyphs. Um, these were used to uh, record the names of rulers, to record, uh, to record important events such as the birth of a king, the accession to the throne of a king. The, uh, they were also used to record the names of places and uh, victories in war. Uh, and th so this was something, this is the historical record that we have from the classic Maya period. Uh, they had an advanced astronomical system. They had a, several different calendars that were used for different purposes. We'll talk more in depth about this next week, but this of course relates directly to one of the subjects of the course, 2012, because they were able to set December 21st, 2012 as an end date. But they were also use their calendars to predict eclipses, to know when the solstices were, so they were very aware of astronomical events. Uh, and finally, they had extensive trade networks. They are believed, the Maya in the classic period that lived in, I'm trying to get this down here, lowland Guatemala and the Yucatan, this area, were believed to engage in trade with this, are, are known to have engaged in trade with the people in Teotihuacan. So this is very long distance trade. They traded food, um, things like shells, feathers, ceramics, and jade. Um, and there's, there's quite a degree of evidence that the Teotihuacan civilization, which was at its height in AD 250, had a significant amount of influence on ancient Maya culture. All right, and so I also wanted to talk about religion because religion for the ancient Maya was very tight, tightly wound, uh, very tightly connected to their politics. Kings were considered to be divine rulers. They wielded divine power. They were viewed as being descendants of the gods. 
They were also believed to be able to communicate with the gods and with ancestors, so founding ancestors of their kingdoms. One of the, the main way that they communicated with their ancestors and with the gods was through ritualized blood sacrifice. And this is something that we refer to as auto-bloodletting, so self-bloodletting, self-sacrifice, cutting yourself to make an offering of blood. And this is what's depicted in these two carvings here, which, are called, which we call lintels. Here we go. Uh, the first, both of them are from the site, oops, excuse me. Both of them are from the site of Yakshilan, which sits on the Rio Usumacinta, which is uh, divide, forms part of the border between Guatemala and Mexico. And um, it, it, the, these lintels date to about 700 AD. So in the first one, you see King, King uh, Shield Jaguar here and his wife, Lady Shulk. She is pulling a thorny rope, which is right here, through her tongue. This was a common thing that the women did. Well, the men had it worse because they did genital bloodletting. So the women, this was one of the things that the women did. They would pull a thorned rope through their, through their tongues and then drip the blood that came out onto a uh, piece of paper. Am I cutting in and out? Okay. I don't know if we can do anything about that. Um, so, so the, the uh, blood was dripped onto a piece of paper. And then in the next lintel here, so this, these are, this is a sequential story essentially, we see Lady Shulk and she's having a vision. So this was the purpose. The blood was dripped onto a piece of paper and then it was burned, creating smoke. And also she's engaged in a hallucinatory type of experience due to the pain and also drugs that were used, um, na you know, natural plants. And so she sees a vision that in this case is believed to be, and you can see it here, it's a, they're usually described as vision serpents, which is right here. No, it was more to have this, to see this vision. And so it would be eating plants. We have less evidence if that was really the case or not, but the idea is that it was a hallucinatory experience in this you know, great smoke cloud of the blood being burned on the paper. And so in this case, what she's seeing is a founding ancestor of the Yakshilan dynasty, of the Yakshilan kingdom. And so she's having a communication with this, with this ancestor. Um, so this is just to give you all an example of kind of how, how the communication occurred and what it, it was very ritually important to the Maya. Blood was also important um, in, as an offering to the gods for when people wanted to take something from the gods. So the Maya believe and still believed and still do believe today that the gods own the land and all of its resources. So that means the trees and the animals. And so as an ancient Maya person wanted to go out and cut down a tree to burn for wood or wanted to kill an animal to eat, they would make an offering of blood to the gods in exchange for doing that, saying, may I do this. This practice continues today. And so uh, many people, if they're building a house, when they cut down a tree, they will offer, make an offering of blood. Other offerings include uh, candles, uh, incense, tortillas, Today, uh, bloodletting is a less common practice and more common is really rare and doesn't happen. Uh, but what people do is sacrifice animals. So a small animal, most commonly a turkey. So when people build a new house, they sacrifice a turkey and that's a gift, an offering to the gods saying, thank you for the trees. Thank you for allowing me to build this house and as a blessing from the gods for, for establishing a new house. Uh, I'd also like to mention here that corn is a sacred crop for the Maya. It has been from the ancient Maya period up until today. The, the popol vuh that uh, Marika mentioned is the, describes that the, most, the successful creation of humans, the humans that we are today, were created out of corn. And so it's believed that humans are made out of corn. It's also the primary staple of the Maya today. So that it's eaten in the form of tamales and tortillas, essentially with every meal. Uh, so very important crop for the Maya. All right, <clears throat> going back to the, the historical overview, 
around 900 AD is we, when we see people starting to leave, abandon these great city-states in the northern lowlands. Uh, this is what has been referred to as the, the collapse of the Maya civilization. But in many ways, this is a misnomer because it didn't collapse. They didn't disappear. They just shifted. They moved in where they settled and they, they spread out. And as you just saw what Marika was described of, we had the flourishing of many different languages. And that is because people spread out from this more uh, centralized area in the northern in the lowlands of Guatemala and Mexico and the Yucatan Peninsula and went migrated to this area, to the highland region, where they became more isolated and so then developed into different languages. Um, but what we do know of what happened at, in this AD 900 period is that we get an end to glyphic writing. So this is essentially the end of the written history that we have on these stone documents from the ancient Maya period. We also have an abandonment of the lowland centers, as I just said. There's many, many people have, many people have proposed many different reasons for why that happened, for why they left these lowland city-states. Um, and most likely it was a variety of factors. Surely there was demographic pressure. So as I mentioned before, you have these large concentrations of people living in this lowland rainforest environment. Contrary to, I think in many ways, popular belief that the rainforest is very fertile, which it is. it is, it has a high degree of biodiversity, but it's all up in the trees, it's above ground, it's not in the soil. So the soil is a th it's thin and not very fertile, and so it's very hard to plant <coughs> crops year after year to sustain large populations in an environment like that. So one of it was just pure ecological breakdown. The environment could no longer support large concentrations of people. Uh, there's also evidence that there was a drought or a series of droughts that would have compounded this ecological unsustainability. And um, the other big, big thing that starts happening around 700 and 800 AD is warfare. So we get lots of warfare going on between the different city-states. Uh, back again to the question about uh, rulers and how you, you're born into that. Marriages between members of different city-states were very important to form alliances between city-states and then to go to war against another city-state. Um, so, but what, what this meant is that there was a move from these large centers in these flat areas to the highland regions where they could set up more defensive sites, so more militarized, smaller city-states is what the people moved to. Uh, and this is what the Spanish encountered when they arrived in the 16th century. And so it's important to realize that, that when the Spanish came to Guatemala and uh, Mexico, which they, they arrived in 1520, that they didn't encounter one unified enemy. The Maya were spread out in different city-states. This was at once a challenge to the Spanish because they had to confront various enemies, but they also used it to their advantage by pitting groups against each other. So they would befriend one Maya group and pit it against another one and then gang up on both of them. Now, as Marika said, she mentioned the Itza and their kingdom of Tayasal that, that fought back until 1697. The Maya fought back hard against the Spanish, and in many ways, the Spanish had a really hard time fighting against the Maya. This despite the fact that they had horses, greater technology in the form of guns that the Maya did not have. Um, so I think it's pretty, pretty amazing that they were able to, in the case of the Itza, fight back for more than 150 years. Now, uh, Guatemala and the other, the other countries where the Maya lived gained independence from Spain. Oh, I wanted to mention first a little bit more about the colonial period, I'm sorry. The colonial period for the Maya was variable depending on where you lived, if you were a Maya person. In some areas of the country, the Maya population was virtually enslaved, treated as, as laborers, as, you know, treated as badly as you could imagine slaves being treated. Um, in other areas of the country, and this is primarily in the areas of the country that, was, uh, that were more mountainous and that were the lowland regions that were more rainforest, there were, the colonization was more directed towards Christianization, towards the conversion to Catholicism. And they, in many cases, Maya living in those regions were left to their own devices. They weren't treated as horribly. 
Uh, what was common throughout the region, though, is that, as Marika mentioned, they were all uh, affected by the diseases brought by the Spanish. It, it clearly decimated the indigenous population. And they were all, in all areas, they were taken out of their rural se settlements and um, put into more urban concentrations so that the Spanish could control and monitor them. Throughout the 500 years, well, throughout the, the colonial period, there was a constant movement back and forth. So the Maya, the Spanish would move the Maya to these urban centers to monitor and control them, and they would constant, constantly be fleeing back to their rural settlements where they could be closer to the land. So there was this constant back and forth. Um, the, uh, the, these, these countries, and I'll, I'll refer specifically to Guatemala, gained independence from Spain uh, in, in 1821. And for many of the Maya, this did not actually represent a change in their life. Uh, this was because the leaders of these new republics, and particularly of Guatemala, looked outward to, dis to establish new export economies. So they, they were ready. We want to get on the bandwagon of international development, international economies. We're going to export crops to the rest of the world. Bananas, coffee, and sugar are all were in the, in the 1800s and continue to be today very important ex export crops from Guatemala. For the people's backs of whom this was built on, of course, were the Maya. They were the laborers to provide uh, who did the planting, who did the harvesting of these crops. And down here you see this is the two black and white photos below are coffee plantations, coffee fincas, and the color photo above is an image of a banana plantation uh, today. Actually, that's a recent image. Um, one of the big players at this point in, the, um, in Guatemala was the United Fruit Company. At, in the 1940s, this company owned up to 40, per, controlled up to 40% of the land in Guatemala. It attempted to build a railroad system, um, and it was, you know, one of the key players in exporting fruit from Guatemala to the United States. And I'll, you'll know why I'm talking about this in a second. So, um, 1944 to 1954 is a very special period in the history of Guatemala. It's known as the 10 years of spring. And during this time, there were two presidents, uh, Juan Jose Arevalo and Jacobo Arbenz, who were successive, ter who had successive terms. And they, uh, Arevalo, who took office first, came in and ha was dedicated to land reform, to taking some of this land away from large plantations and redistributing it to small peasants to essentially create greater social equality in, in Guatemala. Uh, those policies were put into place. There were land, land was taken away from the United Fruit Company and from other large owners of plantations. Arbenz continued these policies when he took office. But of course, for the United States, this was something very scary because this was during the Cold War period where fears of communism and fears of socialism were rampant. So the United, and at the same time, we had the United Fruit Company coming to the United States government. It had close connections with the uh, government and even with the director of the CIA at that point, Dulles, that, um, you know, we don't want this happening. Our lands are being taken away from us. This is in our economic interest, and please don't let this happen. As a result of that, along with the, the fear of communism, the CIA got involved. Our CIA got involved, and... Um, helped overthrow Arbenz in 1954 and put a military dictator in place, uh, uh, Castillo Armas. And so this began a series of uh, military dictators that we have had in Guatemala for, for many years, for about 30 years during the Civil War. This period of the end, this coup that ended, this t the 10 years of spring, really set the stage for Guatemala's Civil War. This is a conflict that lasted 30, 36 years. It dates to the beginning of the 1960s and ended in 1960, 1996 when the peace accords were signed. It was a conflict between the CIA-backed Guatemalan military, so, so our government was, was involved throughout this, and Marxist guerrillas. Uh, the guerrillas did receive support from Cuba. Many, there was a tight uh, connection to Cuba and more loosely to the Soviet 
Union, um, but basically they trained soldiers who lived, you know, for many years in hiding and carried out this uh, guerrilla movement that at the beginning was more organized in the early 1960s and 70s was more organized, was very ph philosophically oriented to Marxism, became less organized as time went on. Um, and part of that was because they were just, you know, the counter and the, the, the Guatemalan military was very strong, was, was supported by our military, had a number of guns and just had sheer numbers, um, were able to really decimate and fight against the guerrilla movement. Um, the thing that's the hardest about this for those of us who work in Guatemala is that the Maya people were involved in this. And in some cases, people say that they were caught between two, two different armies, but really they had an active role in it too. They chose what they believed in, what they, which side they wanted to fight on. Um, and it, but it wasn't also always clear. There were people who certainly didn't choose. Uh, anyone in the 1980s is when the height of the conflict occurred and anyone that lived in a village, any person that was suspected of collaborating with the guerrillas or any village that was suspected of aiding or even harboring guerrillas for one night or selling them food was a target of the army that they, the, the, everyone would be killed, large scale massacres, including women and children, that the village would be burned to the ground. We saw this happening in the 80s over and over again, large scale massacres. During this period, over 200,000 people were killed or disappeared. Most of these people were Maya. Um, it has since now, in the 90s, this period has been declared as a genocide that was directed towards the extermination of the, of the Maya population. Um, and it also just set up this militarization of the civilian population. And this is because all boys and men that were over age 15 were required to stand guard, were given guns and required to stand guard in their village to make sure that the guerrillas were not infiltrating or to report any guerrilla movement that they saw. And so it really created this culture that, that we see now still having impacts today of violence, of this commonality of having guns floating around. Um, the peace accords were signed in 1996. There has been a movement since then to decrease the power of the military. So essentially we had, you know, over 30 years of military dictators in place and controlling things politically in the country. Today, there's 14 million inhabitants in Guatemala. Um, we do have more and more people moving to Guatemala City. I'll touch on that in a minute as why, why. Uh, and we are, the rest of the population is scattered throughout rural villages. The Maya tend to live in rural areas in small villages. They still have their very many close links that they have to the land. This is not true across the board. Uh, there are many Maya who live in cities who are very well educated. This is something that we've seen great changes in in the last 30 years. Um, the Maya in Guatemala make up approximately 50% of the population. So this is one of the, the other reason that we'll talk mostly about Guatemala, it's, it's where we both work, but it's also because this is really the Maya heartland. 50% of the population, that's not true in any of the other countries where Maya live today. Now, I just want to mention that as anthropologists, uh-huh? Who's making up the other 50%? And that's a great question. The other 50% is primarily made up of Ladinos, and this is the term that we use, that anthropologists use to describe people of European descent, of Spanish descent in Guatemala. And so these are the people in Guatemala who speak Spanish. They're Ladinos. Um, in Guatemala, it's hard because there's so much mixing that you, you have people that can move back and forth between classifying as a Maya or classifying as a Ladino, and we usually go on how people classify themselves. But you have Maya who will speak Spanish, and you have some people that will describe themselves as Ladinos, but will also know a Maya language. Um, but yes, Ladinos make up the, the, 50 the other 50% of the population. Um, historically, they've been the minority in the country, so it's, we usually put the estimates between 40 and 60% of, of the Maya population. Uh, now I would say it's more 50%, but the Ladinos are who have been economically and politically dominant, historically. Um, there are two other ethnic groups, non-Maya ethnic groups, indigenous groups in Guatemala. These are the Garifuna, 
who are descent who have they're descended from Africa. They were brought over on slave ships and mixed with Caribbean indigenous populations. They live on the Atlantic coast, so the Caribbean coast of Guatemala, Honduras, and Belize. And interestingly, there are as many Garifuna living in the United States and particularly in New York City as there are in Latin America now. Uh, so there's been heavy migration on their part. The other indigenous group is called the Shinka. So they're part of this other 50%. Mm -hmm. Uh, guerrillas, that's what they were called. There were different organizations th that had names, and so there were uh, a few different lead organizations, but people then and still do call them Los Guerrilla, Los Guerrilleros. So that was just the name. It, you know, and part of it was because it wasn't, it was an open war, but it wasn't an open war. It was a clandestine thing of the guerrillas would come into a village at night and try to get some food. They spent most of their time living in the mountains, in the rainforest. They were in hiding all of the time. And so it wasn't a clear enemy all of the time. And, and I think this is one thing that was hard for people living in villages is if you lived in a village and you didn't want to associate with the guerrillas, you may or may not have a choice about what the army thinks that you're doing. Because if the army was even suspect that you had anything to do with the guerrillas, you would be a target. Mm -hmm. Is this what we now call insurgents? Yes, yes, it, it, absolutely. And, and that's one of the words we use for this. Yes. Any other questions? Okay. Um, great questions. Thank you. Um, and so we'll talk about this more in the, I think in the fourth class when we have our Guatemalan grad student come in who's worked at the UN, but I did want to give you just a little bit of an idea of what it's like uh, to be a Maya person today, and my, uh, Marika will complement that with the video next week. Um, Poverty is a severe problem still, for the, is, is a severe problem. Um, about 60% of the population in Guatemala lives in poverty, and the majority of those people are Maya. About a quarter of the population of the adult population does not know how to read and write. 23% of children under five are underweight, so malnourishment is a big problem. And the region is sub subject to uh, frequent natural, natural disasters, and so, these images show flooding. Um, flooding causes landslides, which knocks people's houses down. Once again, if you're a Maya person, it's more likely that you're living in a rural area and you're affected by things like this. Um, it's also an earthquake-prone region. It also has volcanoes. A couple of years ago, I was there when, when one of the volcanoes erupted. And so this shuts down roads and, and causes problems. And these are, these are fairly regular occurrences. I would say every year there's a, there's a major flooding event. Um, another problem that somebody mentioned is violence. Uh, this, is, of course, is an issue both in Guatemala and in Mexico. Um, and the violence today, whereas during the war period we, we see that as political violence, today it's very tightly connected to drug trafficking. Um, 80%, it's estimated that 80% of the cocaine that goes from Colombia to the United States passes at some point through Guatemala, and it goes precisely through the region where the ruins are, where the ancient Maya had their city-states, because even today this region is not very developed. There's few roads, there's great expanses of land, and so it's very hard to control. It's easy to land a plane there, essentially, without being noticed. Um, there's also a lot of gang problems now. This is primarily uh, located in Guatemala City. But as I mentioned, we, it's, it's a culture of violence that has continued in today of just having a number of guns floating around and people used to the concept of vi violence and seeing graphic images of, of, of bodies and of uh, blood. Um, coupled with this is impunity. Only about 2% of criminal cases in Guatemala are ever brought to trial. So it really makes it a paradise for illicit activities and criminals. Both, both Mexico and Guatemala have very high homicide rates, some of the highest homicide rates in the, um, in the world. Now, the most uh, recent president, who was just, just took office in January, his name is Otto Perez Molina, he ran on a platform of taking a hard line against this violence. So there is you know, there are many people who are fed up. This is why he got elected. 
he's going to take a hard line against the violence. The worry is he's a former general, and he has been implicated in some of the human rights violations during the war period. And so the worry is that he will increase the power of the army in the name of combating this drug violence today. We'll see what happens. He'll hold office for four years, but, but this is something that, that for your regular Guatemalan person, violence is one of the most important issues in your life. Um, and, and once again, I, I just want to reiterate that all of these things that I'm talking about here fall more heavily on the shoulders of the Maya than, than they do on the Ladinos. Uh, the country continues to have agriculture as its economic base. People are subsistence farmers. Uh, many people continue to be subsistence farmers, so they work the land, they feed their family off the land, they may sell some of their crops in the market, and so there is certainly a cash economy for everyone. But for many people, the land is, and, and this is specifically for the Maya, the land is the most important thing for them. Um, this is harder for younger, uh, particularly younger men and younger generations because as the land is passed down from a father to his sons, it gets smaller and smaller, smaller pieces. And so now uh, you see many young men with families who don't have land or who have a piece of land that's too small to earn a living off of. And so they've had to engage, look out, look to other forms of um, labor to, to support their families. One option is to go work in a plantation. So we, we see the same crops that we saw during uh, the 1800s and early 1900s, bananas, coffee, sugar. Today, petroleum is also an export. And interestingly, Guatemala is one of the world's largest producers of cardamom. And so people will go work on plantations um, seasonally, usually just to, for the harvest period. And of course, as you all are well aware, we have people migrating to the United States, to Canada. People also migrate from rural villages to Guatemala City to take a job in a service industry or in a factory. Um, the decisions to do this are hard because in almost all of them, it entails a man leaving his wife and children at home in the rural village and either coming to the United States or coming to the to, to Guatemala City and leaving his family behind. In some cases, they'll bring the family with them. Um, okay, two minutes. Uh, just wanted to touch quickly on political representation of the Maya. It, it is changing. They are not, the Maya have not been well re represented politically, but we do have had a few Congress people who are Maya in Guatemala. We've had an indigenous Maya woman, Rigoberta Menchu, uh, Quiche Maya, run twice for presidential candidate. Um, in Mexico, it's a different situation. We have, we've seen, uh, I don't know if anybody is familiar with the Zapatistas who essentially announced their presence to the world in 1994. At that point, they called for political reform within the Mexican government and had a more of a violent, there was, people were killed and there was a call to arms. In the last few years, they, they've uh, moved away from calling for political reform within the Mexican government to setting up their own autonomous municipalities. So there's about 30 of these essentially villages, communities in southern Mexico and Chiapas that exist in parallel with the Mexican government, but also outside of the Mexican government. And they provide education and government and other social services to, um, to the people that live in these communities based on Maya philosophies, based on Maya philosophies of education and of political participation. All right, and so just to end quickly, um, Maya culture today, as Marika mentioned, uh, well, I just wanna say it's important for us to remember that culture is always changing. It's always adapting. Culture does not disappear. It's something that changes over time, as we've seen with language, as we see with dress. And so today we have 22 Mayan languages spoken in Guatemala and in, in about 7 million speakers of Mayan languages, 7 million or more people. In Mexico, it's about 1.5 million people who speak Mayan languages and there's about nine lang Mayan languages spoken in Mexico and that's in the southern area of Mexico, um, except for the Huastec. Uh, Maya continue to wear traditional dress. This is particularly true of Maya women you can see this here, this is the, the skirt, which we call corte, and the top, the blouse, which is called huipil. You can also see it down here. 
The use of traditional dress is, of course, tightly linked to weaving, which is a long, which is a, an age-old practice by the Maya and continues to be a very honored tradition. And um, also, we do see the continuation of the practice of Maya religion. Today, Maya religion is a mix of ancient traditions, ancient rituals with Catholic practices that have been essentially evolving and blending over the past 500 years. Uh, and I will end on this note, and we will pick up with religion and the meaning of 2012 in our next class. Sorry, I ran too long. I wanted to have time for questions. <laughs>